Um, how about tell a story or a little story to you uh, what took place last year, 2008, uh, learning lunch camera series in the Commonwealth Valley. Now, although this is a technical transfer session, I, I want to uh, really uh, take this from the perspective of it being a strategic discussion. I want, you, I want to challenge you to think a little bit on the bigger picture. Uh, think about uh, dropping those constraints and restraints that we apply to ourselves, the normal boundaries that are out there, simply by virtue of the nature of the, the specialization that we have in our daily jobs. So, coincidentally, the series titles, Nature Knows No Boundaries, and it was no coincidence earlier on that, that Robert mentioned the word evolution. And a lot of you might be aware that this is the 150th anniversary of Charles Darwin's publication, Origin of Species. We don't generally think of him as a, uh, from, from that perspective. We tend to think of him more from the evolution perspective. So I want to stretch the point a little bit, and I want to draw a parallel between evolution and the shift from boundaries to commonalities in the way that the Learning at Lunch series, the Academy series, shifted from informing and educating to identifying the fact that the solution to complex problems lies in a regional or team approach. The first session was entitled Today's Expectations of Tomorrow's Standards, which we truncated to evolution. We looked at the evolution of stormwater and rainwater management and its policies and practices. So we use as a model comparison a project in Courtney called the Glacier View Pond. Not a spectacular project really by any stretch of the imagination, but it, it had some special uh, aspects to it which were worth uh, drawing to your attention. So it was an innovative design based on a cooperative management. Uh, it was in the city of Courtney, the downstream of this was the First Nation plan, and also the CBRD, and contributing to this stormwater project, which in, in actual fact was a stormwater attenuation plan, was um, also the town of Comox. Now, nothing spectacular, but Okay, but the maps to work the same as well. Um, what started off as a normal project at a pre-construction meeting with the, uh, with the contract, it, it became evident very quickly that this could either just be a normal earth-moving type exercise with its inherent type of problems with sediment control, and so vegetation issues. Or we could deal with it in a slightly different way in the contract approaches and said, listen, why don't we deal with this as a lump sum type item? I'm going to present to you a comprehensive environmental management plan and also an erosion sedimentation control program. And we'll use all of the on-site materials and vegetation to ensure that we get this project done on time and at less cost, which is great when we jump in. So what took place is we used the natural materials, we kept all the materials on site, including the vegetation, and the vegetation you're seeing here, in fact, is stripped vegetation. We reapplied that as such. And going back to the first slide, the top left-hand corner, you can see the um, sedimentation control vent in there. That's on either side of the street, where the street was actually around the corner. What was also interesting was this project took place outside the normal fisheries window. And DFO were a, were a very collaborative uh, organization on this project. So because we had the vegetation, installed, already functioning, we were able to get this project online and functioning within the first year without having to wait for full growing season. So here we are, some good communication and collaboration uh, examples for that. The second session, entitled Legal and Policy Strategies to Support Green Infrastructure, in which we truncated to tools, talk about legal and policy tools, and they will engineer green infrastructure to be part of the development planning. So there was a lot of discussion that took place during the assessment, second session. And we, we found very quickly that there were a lot of commonalities, lots of issues and, and um, aspects that were common to all the municipalities and participants. Things such as uh, timing, and I'm not talking about getting things done on time, but timing, doing them in the right order. Surface water runoff, of course, was a key one. And that was dealing with things such as erosion and sedimentation control and making sure that everybody is aware of the best management practices that go with the erosion sedimentation control. How we implement them and how we can make sure that all parties are, are adequately educated and informed. Soil depth was an interesting issue that came up. A lot of discussion took place around this. 
um, making sure that you've got adequate depth for infiltration and absorption. And of course, tacking onto this is building up elevation and lock grading. How do you ensure, or perhaps make sure that you ensure, is more than to the point, that the elevations that you have for lock grading and buildings take into account the volumes of material that are excavated and then either reapplied or taken off site. So that the end result does not end up impacting either the surface water or the ground which was pre-development. And then the one of the last items, and I just picked several here as examples, was the land developer and housing contract responsibility. Just making sure that everybody knows who does what, when they do it, where your boundaries lie. Now, what I've talked about here are a couple of hard tool examples. Um, talking about legislation um, and, and policies here. And one of the most common ones is, is uh, having a good erosion sedimentation control program in place. We're actually in the process of just getting our um, final list to the third reading of the bylaw. There are other great ones out there. The city of Surrey's got a really good one. And we actually plagiarize the largest stuff from it with their permission. Um, other uh, hard tools, for example, are um, having a soil removal file in place, and I touched on that briefly previously. However, there are other things out there. There are what I like to call soft tools, making sure that you can articulate a vision, making sure that you can communicate your plans uh, with others and what you what you intend on. Having an iterative, of me review process and looking for ways to review and update on a regular basis. So we're going back to the basics again, communication and coordination. Because how do we know we're getting it right if we don't know what others' needs and goals are? If we don't communicate unless we communicate. So I'm going to focus on these C words, communicate, coordinate. You've heard a lot of these previously, you're going to hear them again. And go away. So the results of sessions one and two, as well as stimulating the water conversation, uh, recognize the need to look for solutions beyond our own boundaries. So we're learning that with series number three, nature knows no boundaries, we try and get into resource needs. Its focus was on the performance of target group approach. You can't read, you, you, I'm sorry, the print's a little bit out of focus there. But it's actually articulated the same way. Focus on performance, target, approach, land development. It makes sense. These multiple objectives is affordable and results in net environmental benefits at a watershed or a regional scale. So, we thought the session three is to explore the theme of nature knows no boundaries in this program. And if you have no imposed restraints, how things might look like and how solutions might, to problems might differ. So back to Brian, some of the major roots. And the natural, and the natural boundaries that go with those, the watershed boundaries account from areas. And if we impose man imposed boundaries, the unnatural boundaries, we've got something that looks like this. And not all of these are always coincident. And always conform to you. This is an example of uh, the boundary between uh, CBRD and uh, the Strathcona Regional District. The if you look at the, at the watershed to Comox Valley, there are some 20 major drainage basins here. And within the same area, there are 13 different political boundaries. Now, what's also interesting right now is that within the Comox Valley, there are, are five major initiatives underway. And these five major initiatives shown here include the sustainability strategy, a regional sewerage study, etc. You can read what they are. The point is that they have, in general, been dealt with in isolation. They develop their own little boundaries. The area of commonality is relatively small. At least that is what has been happening. And what we want to do is strive for a greater degree of commonality and a decrease in the boundary of what I'm calling the silo factor. We want to make sure that we break down this price when we are talking on a regular basis. We are sharing, we are explaining what the vision is. How can, for example, you have, I'll take an example, regional sewage study. How can you have a regional sewage study and end up with the correct and effective results if you don't know what the regional growth study is looking at and vice versa? How can you build for the correct infrastructure? 